Two different practices have been giving me life lately and providing invitations into spirit-filled spaces. One practice is contemplation, or as our leader calls it, praying and playing with scripture. You sit with a passage and imagine what could be going on in it. We used today's passage over the last few weeks. And there is so much here. Just in the first few verses, there is a treasure trove for your imagination. Mary traveled between 80 to 100 miles to go and visit Elizabeth. Days and days of travel at that time. Mary was young, maybe 15 years old. Would she have traveled alone? On foot? Did she have morning sickness while she traveled? She was in her first trimester. Did Elizabeth have any idea that Mary was coming or that Mary was pregnant? You can see there is a lot here to consider. As we read the start of the Magnificat or Mary's song, I was struck by the word magnify. My brain went quickly to a little kid with a magnifying glass, excitedly investigating nature, intrigued by a leaf or an insect or bark, the glass allowing them to get closer and to see in more detail. Maybe I'm drawn to this because this is me as a little one. I can almost hear a child calling out in wonder all that they are noticing. Look, the grass has this hairy edge. The bark has about 10 shades of brown. I can see all the parts of the grasshopper legs. Mary starts this poem song with my soul magnifies the Lord. To magnify, to make larger and to see closer. Maybe this song is doing that for God's heart. Mary is staring intently and deeply at God and calling out what she sees there. A thread of joy and song bubbles up from Mary in response to Elizabeth. It's not a fluffy song of how good it feels to be a mother or how proud she is that this gift was given to her. Not much of the song is about Mary at all. It is thanks and praise to God naming God's surprising, power-upsetting, consistent, justice-filled, motherly love for God's people. God chooses unexpected people to be bearers of the good news and these baby boys who will change the world. Elizabeth was old and had been barren and childless, making her worth much less in that time. Mary was young, descended from no one worth mentioning, and is pregnant outside of marriage. But Mary's song emphasizes that God is acting well within God's character in choosing her, because this God brings down the powerful and raises up the lowly. God takes a lowly outsider 
and plunks them right at the center of this story. Mary's words here echo Hannah's song just after God granted her her son Samuel and Hannah gave him back to God's work in the temple. Mary must have known these words, maybe taken them to heart. I memorized the Magnificat in college for a lessons and carols style of service. The problem is, I'm not great at putting long passages to memory. I got on the stage and I delivered all of the words, but the verses were in the wrong order. While mine was a fumbling mistake, Mary draws on the words of her foremother, Hannah, and sings her own reimagined song. Mary is overflowing with praise and thanks. I wonder if it had been welling up inside of her, needing to burst forth. Finally, with Elizabeth's prophetic words of greeting, Mary hears a human naming her son as Lord. Full of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth blesses Mary with great joy. Mary is faced with someone who might understand both the miraculous nature of her pregnancy and the mix of emotions that come with it. Feelings of gratefulness and honor, but also a complex situation and possibly communal shame. And Mary sings from this topsy-turvy situation about a God who turns structures of power on their heads, scattering the proud, bringing down the powerful, lifting people up, filling hungry folks with good things, and sending the rich away empty-handed. No wonder Jesus could preach a good sermon when his mother was singing lullabies like this over him. This is how God shows up on earth, bringing justice through the generations. This is not a fluffy Hallmark movie. This is a mother's love giving of her very flesh, showing a love that both embraces by acting in mercy and also correcting. This kind of agape love is active, a choice as much as a feeling. It's the love that Jesus goes on to live out by seeking the well-being of others without expecting anything in return. Loving the forgotten ones who usually fall through the cracks. People like old women and young unmarried mothers. My parents taught a course with leaders from the Pacific Islands. As part of their time together, my mom taught them several songs. One being a setting of the Magnificat that many of you might know. After singing, a few of the participants came up to my parents and said, we can't sing these songs. People will get upset. They knew that these words would challenge their social status quo and offend the rich and the powerful in their congregations. Does hearing this shake us up? And should it? The Women's Bible Commentary puts it this way, 
The Magnificat is the great New Testament song of liberation, personal and social, moral and economic, a revolutionary document of intense conflict and victory. Key themes for the gospel that follows are introduced here, especially the proclamation of good news to the poor. Mary's song is precious to women and other oppressed peoples for its vision of their concrete freedom in systemic injustice. Mary's song captures the already but not yet of God's kingdom in its tenses. Mary speaks about the future of God's work as if it's already completed. This God who has been faithful from generation to generation and will be into the future. God who has made promises to the Hannahs and Sarahs of the past and is working through the Marys and the Elizabeths in this story and will continue working through the Paula's and Sabrina's of the future. Not what God will do, but what God has done. What is the song of thanks and praise rising up for you as we approach Christmas? How can we look back and forward at God's love? Where is that love turning things upside down today and choosing the unexpected players? The second practice that has been helping me remember God in my life is guided meditation and mindfulness. In one practice a few weeks ago, the leader invited us to still our bodies, hold a moment of calm as we let God look at us in love. May you find time this week to become aware and to let God look at you in love. May you then turn that gaze and the work that we do towards love for those who are at the very heart of God. Amen.